right, y'all ready? Yeah. This is one of the longest titles so far this year. It's only been like the second message. <laughs> Faith. <laughs> Amen. All right, we're gonna we're gonna get a little bit. Um, we're gonna get some information. Try to get it inside of us today. I got several scriptures. It's the same scripture, but it's in in a few translations. And they're using a different word in each one of the translations. And, and really, like I tell the guys at Teen Challenge when I'm te teaching, you should read at least four translations of the Bible and you'll get a better view. One translation of the Bible is not going to give you the best view. Okay, you need to have several. As many as you can get, actually, is the best. The more you get, the better you're going to, to get an understanding of some, especially some of the scriptures. Because what they're doing is, is that in order to make their new translation, they have to change words. They've got to do a certain percentage. If they don't do that percentage, they won't be allowed to publish their Bible. And so and it's easy to do because the Greek and the Hebrew, especially the Hebrew, has so many English words for one Hebrew word. And sometimes, sometimes there's up to 20 English words which are the definition of that one Hebrew word because the Hebrew word is, is more like a giant picture than, than just a word. Here in English we have a word for everything. And, uh, but not in, not in Hebrew. They don't have a lot of words as, like we have. But their one word has a huge expression. And Greek is the same way but not as much. And so it's easy to go find different English words but sometimes when they pick a certain English word, it actually loses the meaning of the scripture, okay? Because of the word they have chosen. And uh, so that's why I tell, I tell them, I said, one of the best Bibles really you could go buy is a parallel Bible. Anybody heard of a parallel Bible? There's at least four translations. They do have one with six and it's really thick. And uh, you can get different translations. And, and, but if you open the Bible, you're gonna have all four translations lined up they're not going to go any further than the shortest translation. So you can read one script and go right straight across. You know, I got one at home. It's got the King James, New King James, the NIV, and the New Living. But they got some other translations that you can get. And that way you've got four translations sitting in front of you when you're reading. So you can go see the... And you'll see what I'm talking about, especially. Some people say, oh, I, I only read the King James, and that's how I used to be. And then... Uh, there's a lot of mistakes in the King James. Then they came out with the new King James and they fixed just about every one of them and uh, which then you go, wow, well that sure changed everything. And uh, so now they have, when I started reading different translations, they had 32, now they got like 64 of them. And, uh, and so you can get, you can get lost. You can, but it's exciting to me because you can go to Bible Gateway um, and you can get every translation lined up. If you punch up one scripture and then you can go to Bible Gateway with it and you can go and see every translation with that scripture. You can see how drastic some of them do change. But it gives you a, better, a much better comprehension of the Word of God. How I many of y'all want a much better comprehension? All right, that's three of y'all. Good. <laughs> Amen. Faith, okay? So in Romans 12, 3, this is only a piece of the scripture because it says, um, it says some, something about which breaks it down into the, the body has many parts and so forth. But it, what it's saying is that God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. And so you don't have a complete full faith. Okay? Your faith is enough no matter how tiny it is. Don't get me wrong. But whatever God has made you to be, he's given you the faith to be it. Okay? Are you with me? If you go read the chapter, you'll see that that's what is going on when Paul is writing this. He's saying that there's many body parts, we have many gifts, we don't all have the same gift, but God's given us a measure of faith to be that gift. Jesus was all full faith, okay? He was everything. But now we are his hands, his feet, his eyes, his voice, and so forth. Pastors, apostles, teachers, so forth. And so we each, whatever we are, we have faith to be that. But it's also a measure of faith means that it's a small amount that can grow and, and enlarge. And it also means that you can um, take that faith and unlock the fullness of faith. 
See, just because I have, I'm a pastor saying I have this one gift, but I'm also a, a dad and a, and a brother, and, and we went on, there's so many hats we wear, and God has made it to be so. So that's many gifts that we really do have to make up our, what we are. But we have one real gift that plugs us into the body of Christ. All right? So I've been plugged in and it turns out that I'm a pastor. So I have a, a measure of faith to be a shepherd, to be a pastor. And if I just go with that, it, wor it works. But it doesn't work to the fullness of what God wants it to work to. And so if I pray and I seek God to be a better pastor to grow, my faith will grow, my, my pastorate will grow. I, I have also the gift to teach. And so I do the same thing when I'm praying. And my faith will begin to grow. Jesus said if you have that faith, is, it's sowed in the ground and it grows into a giant tree and the birds lodge in it. That's how your faith can grow. But it also can connect to the fullness of faith. See, especially if, like, if you're a teacher, if you're teaching, it doesn't matter if you're teaching little children or you're teaching older kids or whatever. If you're a teacher, that gift wants to expand into other gifts. Not that we can have those other gifts, but we can understand those other gifts. All right? Just because I might be, you know, a mouth or a hand doesn't mean I can't know what the foot does, right? So my faith will overlap, and that's what joins us all together, okay? Is that I can't have your gift, but I sure can understand it a little better by me praying for you. So as you pray, if you pray for me, you're going to understand messages better. As I pray for you, you're going to understand, you know, this one another. And so as we pray for each other, we start to overlap each other's gifts, and then that's what makes us to quit judging each other, which is what our sinful nature wants to do. And we begin to edify. If I say edify? edify. That's right. Edification is what we are supposed to be doing. So we got unsaved people out there in office and so forth. You need to be praying for them so they can, when they go to bed at night, they can hear and receive dreams and visions from God to turn them from their wicked way. But if you condemn them, you cut yourself off. Okay? You'll stop the process. God won't even allow your faith to overlap somebody else's faith. You'll be isolated. Okay? And you'll be isolated and, and you'll never grow. We need each other to grow in the body of Christ. Okay? So everybody has that? You understand it? Test next week. <laughs> Hebrews 11.1. 1. This is the scripture that gives us the, the definition of the word faith. I mean, and this is the one I'm going to use through some, some um, translations. This is in the New King James. And it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So this is the definition in the, in the New King James. It's also the same way in the King James. And it's telling us that faith is a substance. Okay? So if I, if I looked up... In the King James, in the Strong's Concordance, it only uses the King James. So if you look up the King James, the word substance, you'll get a definition of the word. But it's easy to find out what substance means. So let's quickly, I wanna, I'm going to show you now. The word substance means a solid foundation on which to stand. Okay, so our faith in this particular scripture is telling us that our faith is either solid or it's not. And if it's not, you're not going to stand very well on it, especially if it's liquid or vapor, okay? But this is solid. And the definition goes a little bit further to say that as you grow, it will get more solid if you grow in the Lord. And it's kind of neat because really it's making reference to cement, concrete, stuff we drive on. And it takes years for concrete to get totally cured. How many of y'all knew that? I mean, I had to look it up to find out. So, But it takes a long time. They say that cement down in the heart of the Hoover Dam is still curing. Decades, it's still curing. Because it just takes so long for that drying effect to happen down deep. Well, it's the same way in what this scripture, and what this word substance is saying. It's saying that all through your life, it's never going to totally cure. 
you're going to always be getting a stronger foundation if you stay in the Lord and stay studying and reading and you keep using your faith. It becomes more stability, more stability under your feet. Okay? So this is just, like I said, one translation of the Bible. And as, and as others, if you go punch up Gateway, you'll see that a lot of the translations use the word substance. I forgot how many, but there's a bunch. And so we now have this, this thought, and you could, you could grow your faith just with this thought, because then you know that it's still curing, so you need to keep on using your faith and, and keep on absorbing Scripture and getting that into you, okay? And so, but everybody has that measure of faith. And so that measure of faith, is, especially after you get saved, because, I mean, even the unsaved have a measure of faith. That's what makes us human beings, makes us able to make choices and decisions, is the faith that we have. It makes them able to, to go to college and get a job, good job as easy as a Christian could, because it's just faith. Now, one thing you need to understand about faith, I think before I even go on, is that faith is neither, it's, it's neither positive nor negative. It's just faith. And because of our carnal nature, especially when, if you, when you were unsaved, you were using your faith in a negative fashion, and it was producing things in your life, negative things. But when the Bible talks about faith, it doesn't go that direction to say that. You see, the Bible is written in such a way that we have, we have this heads of like a coin. It's, it's the heads. It's, it's telling you good stuff about faith. But wherever there's a heads, there has to be a tails. I mean, as simple as that. There's always this, this backside. It's just like when the Lord was talking to the church and saw us, he said, if you continue to do what I'm calling you to do, okay, what I'm telling you to do, then he's saying, he's saying that I will not erase your name out of the Lamb's Book of Life. So that's pretty neat because if you continue to do what I do, I will not erase your name out of the Lamb's Book of Life. But what is it saying that we don't read? I mean, isn't it saying, if you don't continue to do what I'm doing, then I will erase your name out of the book of life. Why well, say, continue doing what I'm telling you to do, and I won't erase your name, if he's not also saying, if you don't continue doing what I'm telling you to do, I'm going to erase your name. Right? So, that's how it is in the Bible. There's things being said in that Bible, it's easy, because we should know how to do this, just flip it over. So let me see, it was a warning that if they don't continue, they could have their names erased from the book of life. So when we read and stuff, especially about faith, it just says faith. And it talks about how the people of old, if you read the whole 11th chapter, is the chapter on faith, and how they believed God, and they did miraculous things, and, and did great things for God because of their faith. And then it goes on to verse 6 saying, without faith, well, in other words, it's not saying that you can't, you can't actually not have faith because it's part of you. So when it says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So it's not saying that it's, it's possible for you to not have faith. Jesus said, where's your faith? You know, and they had faith, but they weren't using it. And so we need to, we need to interpret Scripture in the light of, you know... How can I say this? In the, in the light of, well, the way, the way we live, we got to understand because we do exactly what the scriptures are doing. So it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Okay? So it's saying if you don't use your faith to seek God, because then it says, for you first have to believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder to them who diligently seek Him. That's in verse 6, on the chapter of faith. So, without you using your faith to seek out God, you can't even please Him. See, so what will you be doing with your faith if you don't have faith like the Scripture says? You, are, you do have it and you're using it. But you're using it for your own glory or for negative, And it's going to produce death in your life. It's just going to, it's just going to produce death. Whatever it is that you're plugging into, okay? So, 
And so there's so many scriptures, like, like for instance, when the Bible says we were dead in trespasses and sin. Everybody understand that? Have you ever read that? That's what we were. We were unsaved and we were dead in trespasses and sin. So, what's the opposite of that? We were alive to sin. Okay? We were alive to the things of the world. But we were dead to God because of sin. If you're alive to sin, you're dead to God. But if you're alive to God, you're dead to sin. Okay? So this is the way we need to, when you read in Scripture, that's how you've got to let the Holy Spirit speak to you to do the flipping around. I mean, I remember the first time I ever saw that, I was, you know, just reading my Bible, reading my Bible, and then I read the script and I went, oh wow, I actually see what it's saying. It's a warning if I don't continue, okay, and stuff like that. So, the word substance means a solid foundation on which to stand. Hebrews 11.1, 1, next translation, is the Holman Christian Standard Bible. How f now faith is the reality of what is hoped for. The proof of what is not seen. So reality and substance in the English, two different spectrums. Okay? Does anybody catch what I'm saying? Substance means more of a solid foundation that is getting more solid as I believe and I continue in the Lord. Now comes the reality. It says faith is the reality of what is hoped for. Now, reality and substance are both English words to define the word faith, so they can use it, okay? The word reality means what actually exists. Now, what it's saying is, is that what actually exists is invisible to us. Everything about life that we do see came from the invisible realm with God. Romans 1.20 tells us that. For the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen. They are understood by the things that are made. That even his eternal Godhead in power, that they are without excuse. We can understand God by the things we see. The things we see as a manifestation of something that is real in the visible world. The stuff we see is not real. And that's kind of crazy because I'm touching this. This is very real. And if I, if I know my wood right, this piece up here was, came out of an oak tree, which is very real. You run your car into it, you'd know it, okay? Or you run into it playing football like I have done. You, can, you definitely know how solid that tree is. It's real. But when Christ came and appeared to his disciples, it says that the doors were shut. And there he was. So in other words, that door, he could have just walked right through the door. Because the, the door and the wood it was made out of, is, is all it is is a manifestation of something that is something we can't see. So when the description here says, the word of reality means what actually exists. If we back up, now faith is the reality. It's, it's not the stuff that you see, even though... The reality is what's real that's in the, in the spirit realm is what you and I need. And it, and it needs to manifest itself in the physical world. Like healing. Like money. <laughs> you know, especially when you got to pay your bills. You know, you need something. Now, it, it isn't that you pray hard enough and then you look on the table and it's going to be the stack of money that's going to appear. It doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean that there's a reality that God said that he said, I will cause you to have wealth. So that's the reality. And when you take that and say, oh good, God wants everybody to be rich, you missed it. That's not what it's saying at all. Because he's talking about what is spiritual. Do you need money in heaven? No. You don't even have to be prayed for to be healed, right? Because you're gonna, there won't be any sickness, no disease. Every food is free. Everything that God has is, is abundant and you can have at it. It never runs out. The water is so pure. We don't have water anywhere on this planet as pure as the water that's there. The trees, you go take and pick the fruit off of them. That's the reality. That's real. 
That's where you need to get the substance. Something tangible. Something you can stand on. Something that you can, you know, when they, they prove that their preaching was of God by the manifestation of healing and different gifts that are still available today. That proves that, you know, God is real. We're going to see something at the end on one of my stories from the Bible. So right now we got the word substance, we got the word reality, and, uh, which means actual. So what it's saying is, if you want to put the two words together to get the word faith, it's saying true reality isn't here. True reality is, is all around us. It's in the invisible realm. But that is what reality is. Now, here's the problem with the prosperity message. The problem with the prosperity message is that it's focused on this life. It's focused on something that's going to pass away. It's focused on something that's really not even real. Do you need a big bank account? No, you need Jesus. He said, I will supply all you need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Okay, So if you have money, that's great. But I'm just saying that the money here is going to perish. It's going to, they're going to be thrown in the streets in Revelation. They have no value. Right now it has value because man has given it value. And it used to be based on gold and silver. That's, out the, that's been gone, long gone. Your money is actually worthless. <laughs> it's becoming more worthless by the day. Right? You know, what we used to get years ago when I was a kid, a candy bar for a nickel, I mean, now it's almost two bucks. You know, I mean, that's... You know, so, and eventually, you won't even be able to buy it. <laughs> it's, that'd be terrible not to be able to buy a candy bar. So, it's talking here about now, faith is wanting to, if you want to put life to faith, it's wanting to unlock the reality, the truth. It wants to unlock it in your soul. It wants to make heaven and, and all the gifts and promises of God real to you. So that when you see a child and the child is sick, you can you just lay your hands. This isn't real. It's got to go in Jesus' name. And it will go. But right now, we have to develop that faith and, be, and start becoming believers. I mean, we're living in a world, we have doctors, we have medicine, we, and they're learning new stuff all the time, and we're finding out that they're more about money than what they are about actually healing people. And uh, because there are things out there and ways out there for people to be healed, scientifically, physically, that they're not telling people about, because I think they want to depopulate the world. So you start, and as you start finding the truth, you see this. I'm not worried about them wanting to depopulate the world. I'm not worried about wicked people. Because as long as I have a Lord, they can do me what they want. Amen. I, mean, I don't care. I'm not afraid of sickness. You know, I mean, it, if I get sick, I get sick. But it's, I'm going to build up my faith. Building up my faith. And, and be ready for anything that this world throws at me. Are you ready for anything? I don't know anything. I don't know what the world has to throw at me. No, you don't, but the Holy Spirit does. And we're not out there trying to learn all the counterfeits. We're just trying to know the real. Okay? So, next one, Hebrews 11.1. 1. This is in the New Living Translation. Now, this one says, Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Okay? So, it, now we have this new word, confidence. It's an interesting word. Many of the translations use it to be confident. The word confidence, it's the same word, just said differently, but it, it's the word confident. So the word confidence means knowing that something will happen. Okay? In other words, when we were in the world, even, even in the church too, that we, we don't Let's see, I can say this. We don't realize that we're using faith every day. When we say and let a word out of our mouth that we shouldn't let out, like, you know, I just don't know, I, I doubt that, or even worse words than that. We don't realize that we're, we're putting faith into action, and it might not materialize that instant, but if you continue to say those things, 
Your faith is going to produce it. I mean, I don't know how many people I've heard throughout my Christian walk and my ministry, so I just don't know why everything just keeps going wrong with me. And, I, and if I could sit down with them just and listen to what they're saying, just that, their own words will tell me why they're having nothing but problems. Because they're using their faith and they're speaking it. All right, let me tell you how powerful this is, okay? Everybody with me? All right, nobody's sleeping, right? I'm going to send Wayne to come get you. <laughs> Amen. Here's the deal about faith. And here's the deal about speaking. And how powerful it is. How'd you get saved? That's right. It says in Romans, you believed. And then you opened your mouth and confessed. How powerful is that? You didn't, you didn't read your Bible through 47 times. You didn't do a study course. You know, you didn't learn how to speak in, in the words of God and so forth. And this is before you even probably started to read the Bible. Maybe you just started or something. But you weren't even saved and then you're saved. How powerful is that? Because it says, For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and then confession is made unto salvation. So if our words of confession that Jesus died for my sins and I repent of my sins then, and, I, and then I got saved by that, just think what other words are doing. And that's the point. Faith is taking everything you say and it's just faith. There's no positive or negative to it. It's the creative power of God that he's put in you to make you godlike. Animals don't have that, but people do. And they create it in their future. So here's the word confidence. And it means knowing, okay? Knowing that something's going to happen, good or bad. And if you know that something is going to happen, then don't we want something good? I mean, that just makes sense. I mean, you know, the kids in that classroom could understand that. Don't you want some candy, you know? Well, you, if you be good, you get the candy at the end. So what am I saying? If you don't be good, no candy. <laughs> kids can understand that. It's amazing. Adults don't seem to understand anything. We just stand around sometimes it's like dumb sheep or cows just staring. I did, what did you just say? You know, and it's like, listen to me slowly. If you want a blessing, you have to speak blessing. If you want to be cursed, oh, I don't want to be cursed, then stop cursing yourself. Simple as that. So the word confidence means knowing that something will happen. Okay? Next one, Hebrew 11. One. Once again, this is in, in um, um, God's Word. And it says, faith assures. Bunches of them. I don't know, 60-something English translations use the word assured or assures. Faith assures us of things we expect and co convinces us of the existence of things we cannot see. The word convinces there too. But assures is the word. Faith assures. The word assures means a guarantee without any doubt. Hmm. But here's the deal about this word, using this word, is that it makes faith is a come-along partner. Someone who's highly intelligent of all God is. And he comes along you and he tells you, if you would, if you would begin to speak this right, and with blessing, you will get a blessing. He begins to, to encourage he assures you that if you do live right, then what you're praying for is going to manifest. Okay? So, this particular scripture, by using the word assures, is setting faith as a being, as someone coming alongside. And faith is alive because you make it alive. Okay? It's like waiting. God gives everybody a measure of faith, and it's just like, Tell me to do something. You know, you have the control. Like this. You know, 
like AI. Man programs it, they destroy the world. All right, so simple as that. Why? Because they looked into the heart of man and said, oh, man's killing each other. Let's us kill them too. And, you know, so that's where we're heading anyway, but I don't want to go there. <laughs> I, I watch too much YouTube. Anyway, the, I, the, uh, the thought here is just simply that faith isn't like a being, but you make it alive so it is alive. And it's it's like waiting for you to command it, okay? And so it's standing there and it's saying, tell me to do something. And you open your mouth and you let out something you shouldn't let out and it says, oh, okay. And then it starts to make it happen. It starts to produce it. And so it, then it gets quiet again, waiting for the next command. And in your conversation with people, what you're saying at home in the privacy of your own home, don't think people aren't here. As a matter of fact, in Proverbs it says, don't say bad things about the king because a little bird's going to fly from your window and go tell the king what you just said. Better make sure those birds are dead. All right? And, uh, because I know God is right there. He's in your house. He's listening. And faith is just like it's standing there saying, okay, give me the next command. And you keep on saying the trash and it's starting to produce it in your life you're going to start seeing things happen. You're not even going to recognize. I'm always sick, never healthy. I'm always going through this. And you've got to pay attention to what you're saying. But this word assures means that it's a guarantee that something's going to happen. But it doesn't say good or bad. Are you on the same page with me? Are you listening? Hebrews 11.1 1 in the easy to read version. I only chose these because they, these, they, they had a different word. Now faith is what makes real the things we hope for. It is proof of what we cannot see. I like the way it's worded in there because it makes real the things that we are hoping for. So this is more of a definitely we hope <laughs> that it's a positive thought. Faith is like ready to make real what you're hoping for. What do you need this morning? Faith is right there saying, hey, let's make something good. Okay? The word real is kind of like reality means to actually exist. Okay? To actually exist. But this time, by using this word, the other word in reality of what's real is what's in the invisible realm. That's what reality is. But this one is saying, is, is that word, re, um, reality, this one real is meaning that it's, it's just like the word guarantee. See, all these words are really kind of similar, and they form the word faith. So they, they cross each other as far as understanding. But this one is actually saying what the other one said a minute ago about guarantee, to actually make it exist. Now that's kind of kind of neat too, because this word... Uh, real is actually meaning make it live. Okay? Frankenstein. It's alive! Maybe y'all haven't seen Frankenstein. You know, we got, we got wars and everything going on in this world and people are taking sides and it's, I always see that. Election coming up, you're going to see the sides, you know, taking sides. We're not here to take sides. This is not what Christians are here to do. We're here to show the glory of God. We're here to heal the sick, cast out devils. We're here to, to demonstrate who Jesus is to a world that can't see him. Boy, I'm not getting no amens today. It's okay. I don't care. I, I, amen, I, I amen myself. Amen, Brother Jim. Preach it. What can I do? Everybody got quiet. That means everybody is guilty. All right. This is, this is my definition. Faith is the ingredient that solidifies, makes solid what you're asking for or makes real. So faith is that ingredient. It's like with cement. If you don't put, I think it's lime. I think it's lime that they put in. Something that is in there. I'm pretty sure it's lime. If they don't, it won't harden. I was, when I was in high school, I took um, this class. That's what it was called. 
and we had to mix cement. And they were teaching us how to do that. And they gave us mortar. And it wasn't cement, but it said cement on the side of the bag. And so when we made it, and it hardened, they took the frame off, and he went over there, and he just hit it with the hammer like that, and it fell apart. And so we didn't know, we didn't know. Man, why did it do that? I mean, we walk in on cement, we don't see it crumbling. He hit the floor with the hammer, and it didn't, it didn't crumble. And he began to tell us the difference between mortar cement and real cement, okay? That's how I remember that. But anyway, so there was something that was in that real cement that would make it harden where you can drive on it with your car. It only takes, the next day you can walk on it, and then within so many days you can drive on it, drive a truck on it. I mean, they put steel on that thing, and they drive tonnage of vehicles on it, right? So it makes it strong. Holds back all the pressure, that water at the Hoover Dam and all the other dams. And, uh, but faith is the ingredient that solidifies. It's, the, it's, what's, it's what you need to make something like healing appear. And, you know, in finance, not appearing, like I said, stacked up, but the wisdom to gain wealth from the Lord and what you need to do. You know, the worst thing that people do is when they get themselves in a financial uh, straits and it start going down, is they stop giving to God's work. And now you see, it's just, it's just the law of the harvest. What you sow, you're going to reap type of thing. You sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. So I'm not preaching tithing or, or any type of church giving. I'm just saying that when, they, when people start getting themselves financially, you know, in a hole, they stop giving. Okay? They just pull back all giving to the Lord. Because I just can't pay my bills. But then in a matter of a little bit of time, they don't even have enough money, even by doing that, to pay their bills. You know, there's a truth in the Bible about giving to God first. And that truth is just simply, is He first in your life or not? And the faith that you have is doing whatever it is that it's doing. Making things good or bad in your life. Why is that so? But it just, it's just the way it is. It's what God has created and it's called faith. Now, in Hebrews 4 it says, this, is, this to me is like, when it comes to faith, it's like the, the most important scripture that's in the Bible. It's a couple of scriptures. And it talks about here how Israel did not enter into the promised land. Okay? And this is the reason why they, were got, they got giants and they didn't go in. 40 years they died off and then finally they did go in. But in Hebrews 4 it says this, Therefore, a sense of promise. Now, there's exceeding great promises in the Bible. Lots of them. Sometimes, some people say there's 3,000. Some say there's more than that. Some say there's a little less than that. Doesn't matter. There's a bunch. And the promises of God, they are yes and amen. That means positive faith. Yes and amen. So, so it's saying sense of promise remains of entering his rest. If you're sick, you need to enter rest. You need a healing. If, you have, if you're in debt, you need money. So you, that would bring rest. You don't have to be stressed out, right? So Jesus has come to bring rest for us in all areas of our life. And in their case, the promised land was the land flow in the milk and honey, the place of rest they were going to. It's a picture of the true promise that has come, which is Jesus, okay? Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, Let's, let us fear. Now see, this is, there's two places in the Bible that talk about this good type of fear. One of them you're reading right here. That would come short of the promises. The other one is the, it's, it's the beginning of wisdom and knowledge, the fear of the Lord. Okay? That's a good one because what that one says is that God who created faith is going to make come up Whatever you want. What do you want? So let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel, the good news, was a different, it was a little different because it talked about the coming of the Messiah. And for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith and those who heard it. 
So, all right, I'm talking to you about faith. I'm talking to you about the things you're doing and the things you're saying is producing something good or something bad. How many of y'all have heard me say that? The rest of y'all wake up. Okay, so I think that was a butt spot, everybody. But you heard me say that it's not positive and negative and it's going to come up and then you'll have evidence of it being positive or negative. Okay? And now we don't want it to come up bad and then you got the evidence. We should know the truth already. How? By deliberately mixing faith with what we have heard. I can't, I can't say any slower than my wife says you need to slow down sometimes. I can't go any slower than that. <laughs> slow down so that they understand. Yes, darling. She's the voice of the Holy Spirit in my life, believe me. <laughs> I, have, I have meddled out because of that lady. She'll tell you. Oh, yeah. Maybe not. Maybe you don't want to tell them. Okay. <laughs> so anyway. Okay, there's your faith. You got it. It's already there. It's part of your being. You're using it all the time. Because you're mixing it with what you don't believe. I just don't believe if I say things right, you know, things come out good. See, you're a doubter. So now you're mixing faith with doubt. So nothing good's coming up. But just look at your life for just a minute. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are. It doesn't matter how poor you are. It doesn't matter what your intentions are or anything. Faith doesn't care. It's like a computer. It's just a computer. It runs programs. Faith is not going to listen to you go, oh, please, faith. I need something. It doesn't hear, oh, please, faith. It's just waiting for you to command it to do something. Okay? It's like AI. It's, it's, it's a program. It doesn't have any mercy. It doesn't have any compassion. It doesn't know that human trait. And that's the same thing with faith. It doesn't have all of that. If, it, if you're speaking death, it's going to give you death. It's not going to say, oh, you poor thing. It's not going to do that. It's just going to produce death in your life. Now, I'm not talking about physical death. That would be something that could happen from us sowing bad things. But I'm talking about all these bad things happening. That's death. You know, like the Lord has come to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. Amen. It's that that we need to be speaking, okay? For we who have believed, I like this. Some people say this is having to do with the old Sabbath day on Saturday. It's just kind of crazy. Because it's saying, for we who have believed, so my question is, do you believe? Yes. Ah, does everybody in here say they believe? Yes. You're going to change how you talk? Yes. You're going <laughs> to... Yeah, well that's good. Who said I would try? Oh, I thought I heard it come from back there. <laughs> You better try. She's my wife. She needs to do it. I need to do it too. We all need to do it. I'm, I'm just as guilty. I'm human. Things happen and I, you know, I used to get angry first and then change my anger and straighten up and figure things out. And I found out that I was getting angry because something went wrong, but I was causing the wrong. So now I have to fix it. <laughs> and then when I would fix it, it would stay fixed only until... Maybe a week after or something. I had to learn to shut up. For we who have believed do enter that rest. Why? By having our needs met. You know, if you're sick, you're not at rest. You're sick. So you need to get better. It might be a slow process. Could be instantaneous. Could be a miracle. Could be a healing. Whatever. Now, as he said... So I swore, now listen to this, okay, everybody got their ears open, right? Anybody need a hearing aid so you can hear me? All right. <laughs> so I swore, this is God, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So God is swearing that. If you use negative, any, I mean, if you use faith, anything other than positive, I swear you will not enter what Jesus has come to provide for you. 
There's something else too in the Bible that says that. And it says after the Lord's Prayer, they said, the Lord goes back to, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. God will treat you as if you're not even saved to get you to forgive. I mean, that's the way it is. God wants you to walk in abundance. You're here to be a witness, and you're not being the greatest witness you can be if you got this stuff plaguing you all the time. Why do they want what you have? I just don't understand why they don't want to come to the Lord. Maybe they don't like what they see. Okay? Maybe we need some more of that good faith. But this look at what God's saying. He said, I swore. So he swore that those, those people would not enter the promises of God, the promised land, and they died off in the wilderness. He forgave them, though, because Moses asked them to, except for the ten spies. Pac Man ate them. You know? They, they just. That must have been. That would must have made them repent. They were ready to go attack after that. You know, and the guy said, No, that's it. I told you. You're dying in the wilderness. You're not going in to the promised land. So we have these exceeding great promises, but you can be blocked from going into them. Boy, let me tell you something. As a Christian, you need those promises. They're, they're designed for you to be a witness, to glorify the Savior, to let people know that Jesus Christ loves them. Amen? Amen. Now sin will keep us in bondage and faith will, or should I say can, set us free. Because here's the deal. I wrote that and now I'm looking at it and I got something I could add to it. And that is that sin will keep you in bondage but faith will keep you in bondage too. That's right. It'll keep you in bondage if you use it wrong. Take a gun and you shoot. You take a gun and you shoot. It's the same gun, doing the same thing, except you're dead. <laughs> and so faith the same way. Take my faith and speak it out in a positive or speak it out in a negative. Okay? So anyway, let me give you a story about faith and then we're going to pray. Y'all might not go home today. <laughs> in Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, now I want to give you this, this is an awesome story. I love it. And it says, And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near to the door, and he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men, and when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Everybody remember the story? Okay. Then Jesus saw their faith. I use it all the time. He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, if I tell somebody, you tell somebody, or Jesus told somebody, your sins are forgiven. Well, whose sins are going to be forgiven? The one Jesus said, right? I mean, we, if we tell somebody your sins are forgiven, well, if they're forgiven, there's going to have to be some proof. But when Jesus said that to him, he didn't see anything happen. Okay? So we, we know that Jesus has the power to forgive sins. So we know that man's sins were forgiven. But he just laid there paralyzed and that was better than saying, which he does later, take up your bed and walk. That was much better to say your sins are forgiven than to take up your bed. But there was a need to say your sins are forgiven. So they said it was blaspheming God. Why? They didn't see any evidence. You can't, this guy can't forgive sins. But he can and he did. So, but he needed to do a demonstration to prove that the man's sins were forgiven. Because what he was about to say now, if he still had sin, he would not have gotten up. So then he says, but immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. So they're all quiet now, scribes. 
and they're like, oh man, he's going to the, he's going to the next level. He's already blaspheming, saying, thinking he can forgive sins. Now he's going to try to make the man get up and walk. So they're all quiet. Let's see. But i tell you what they were looking at. If the man gets up, then that means that those sins that we couldn't see were truly forgiven. Because if they're not, he's not getting up. Okay? That you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went out in the presence of them all. So that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying to you that faith will take what is invisible and manifest it in the physical, good, bad. In this case, what was in the invisible was why the man was in bondage, which materialized into him being a, para, a paralytic, okay? So whatever he did that caused that happened because of sin. Many a time he told people, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come on you. So the thing that was coming on him, not everything happened because of sin. But what did come on this man evidently had to do with his sins. So before he would ever get up and walk, sin's got to be removed. The chains have got to go. Whatever's holding him now needs to go, which was sin. So then they said, you can't forgive sins. I'll prove to you that the chains are gone. I'll prove to you that the man is forgiven. Take up your bed and walk, and he does. And they shut up. See, especially in that culture, the scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, all of them, they knew, they knew the process because God had showed them the process. That they needed to be forgiven before God would touch them. Okay? James 5. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church and they should pray over him after anointing him with olive oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith shall save the sick person, and the Lord will restore him to health. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. And it's not me, even though he told the apostles, whatever sins you remit, they're remitted, whatever ones you, you know, retain, they're retained, so whatever, and all of that. And he said, forgiven or not, you have the power to do that. In this case here, it's saying, my job is an elder to anoint you with oil and pray a prayer of faith with you. Okay? And if there is any sins there that would stop you from getting it, God saying he, through, the, through this, whatever, with me anointing, he's going to forgive your sins. Because if he doesn't, in the sins there producing whatever the problem is, you're never going to get it. Okay? And you know, it's the same thing in communion. They had to rightly discern the communion because in the communion they could have been healed, but they would have repented first and then took and understood what they were doing. They wouldn't have had to die, he said. So this invisible realm out there is the one that taskmasters are the ones that are holding chains on us. Our words, sin, and I don't know what else, but God does know. Sometimes it's, it's just because we don't understand. It's easy to tie someone up who doesn't understand. But once he understands, and once he gets the wisdom inside, he'll break those chains. But it has nothing to do with sin. We all, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have messed up. We all have let words out, including myself, that have caused problems in my life. We've all done things. And so even though the words of my mouth wasn't directly a sin, they were producing problems. Not terribly bad problems that would have cut me off from going to heaven, but they were producing problems. And so I had to start talking right. Thinking about what I was about to say and don't let words out of my mouth that didn't edify. Amen? So right now what we're going to do is that if you, need, if you need something this morning, a healing, 
I want you to just come on up in the front. I'm going to anoint you with oil. And um, there's faith in this place. I think that as I was speaking, that um, y'all, the Holy Spirit started showing you where you have went astray in some areas, maybe. I don't know. I just know that that's how He works. He's a loving God who cares for you very much. Amen. Amen. Let's just pray. Father, we just come before you. And we do. We repent of our sins or anything that would hinder a move of your spirit this morning. We have people up here that, that need a touch. Need a touch, oh Lord, one way or the other, whether it's physical or mental or something, just something going on in their life. Could be financial, could be anything. It, you know, it could be a million things. But in order for anything to materialize, either today or in the days to come, they have to hold true to their faith and the truth of God's word. They have to know, O oh Lord, that you are for us and not against us. They have to know that, that what can separate us from your love? Nothing. Nothing can separate us from your love. No matter what. No matter what we go through in life, no matter how bad it might be. Sometimes it's, it's not something to do with, us, with a sin or something. It's just an attack from the enemy. And just that attack... He'll get a hold of us, not in us, but a hold of us. And it's because of what we, how we react to the attack. The Bible says, be still and know that He is God. So in the midst of the storm, the midst of the attack, we need to put that shield of faith up and stand until the deliverance comes. Trusting in the Lord that He will move this, this mountain. He will cause this enemy to be destroyed. As we have all these pictures in the Old Testament of you doing mighty things. I'm reminded of Gideon went in with 300 soldiers on a massive army of Mennonites and the Mal Malachites. And there was just so many they couldn't even see the end of the army. And yet when they began to attack, the confusion they sent, they killed each other. And they began to wipe out the whole army, just 300 men. I'm reminded, O oh Lord, of other stories in the Bible that tell me how, how you bring victory and how you triumph over an attack of the enemy. So if it's an attack or if it's something that they've said or some sin, we just pray forgiveness and we just pray right now victory. That you will rout the enemy. You'll come in, attack us one way and run before us in seven. So we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Give you praise. If you have a particular spot on your body that needs a touch from God, put your hand on it. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. Father, we just love you this morning. And right now we pray for those that are sick. Someone that has maybe something in their body. And we just pray right now that it would be gone. Be removed right now in Jesus' holy name. We thank you, Lord, because you hear us when we pray. Father, right now, some of them have some other things going on with them, oh Lord. We pray that that mountain will be removed. We pray revelation truth to come into them. And you are routing the enemy off of them. Some of them are just under attack. They live a righteous life. And they are a target by the enemy. But I pray that you teach them. How to be a strong warrior for Jesus. To put on the armor of God. To learn to use the sword of the spirit. The word of God. For the word of God is quick and powerful. And sharper than any two edged sword. Dividing the son of soul and spirit. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Lord, you, you see their thoughts. And the enemy is trying to say and have them speak it out of their mouth that they, they worry and they doubt and they're full of anxiety. 
and they don't understand all these words the devil wants them to speak it because he knows how powerful when a word is spoken but Lord today we just we cut that off in Jesus name that the only words coming out of your mouth would be words of edification and life words of the scripture and truth the word of God that will come out of their mouth that they will edify and they will pray and they will become intercessors in the power of God so I speak healing over this place mentally spiritually physically in every which way that it can be let it come upon them and overtake them oh God it's the first 14 scriptures in Deuteronomy that they will be the head and not the tail they will be blessed coming in and going out the enemy will come against them one way and flee seven that Lord that you will cause their fields to be in abundance that their life will become abundant oh Lord in Jesus name the monies will come in in such a way that would be just blow their mind to take care of their debts and I believe right now that Lord you're moving upon them by your spirit you're causing faith to rise up you're causing it to grow it's moved up it has sprung up in their hearts to bring forth the truth so Lord in Jesus name in this coming week I pray that they will see a manifestation of the faith that they're using right here today they will see and experience the things that they have need of that there are answers to their prayer today and let it be done in Jesus name and we all said Amen. Amen.